Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs, the uh, head of the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, John Gilliard. He's a professor of parasitology at Calgary University. We're going to talk about um, you know various parasites and uh, how they accumulate drug resistance, and why they, they they become resistant now. So, John, thanks for coming. You're welcome, Richard. It's great to to do this. Yeah. Well, in the world of parasites, which ones do you uh, enjoy working with, and which, which ones do you focus on? So the main focus really is a core of um, livestock nematodes, which are roundworms. Um, And we also more recently work on related parasites in humans with soil transit helmet, a large roundworm. So um, the core of the lab works on a particular parasite called homonchus contortus, which is a sheep parasite, which is the nearest thing we've got to a model. And then we kind of build out from there into other gastro livestock. And then in a lot of the same approaches. Homunculus contortus. Homunculus contortus. So he contortus. Yeah, so it's heme as in blood, because it's a blood feeding parasite. Mm. Um, and that's where the name comes from. And contortus, because that's a good question. I work on it and I I, I presume I know why it's called contortus. <laughs> I think I do. Uh, is it uh, has this kind of barb what's called a barber's pole appearance of the gut. When you look at it, it's a very small worm, it's about two centimeters in length. And when you look at it, just grossly. It has its uh, intestines spiraling around its gonad along the length of the worm. So it looks like a barber's pork, intestines of blood. So I think that's why it's called contortus. Huh. Okay. And um, why is this a good model for studying uh, various parasites? Yeah, so, so I think it's for a variety of reasons. The biggest one really is it's the kind of king of drug resistance, if you want to put it that way. It's very, very adept at becoming resistant resistant it's the first parasite uh, of that type to have described for it it's arguably the one where it's most widespread to most drugs and so if you're studying resistance kind of the poster child uh, also uh, this group of organisms does have some major challenges in terms of experimental um, and that applies to homonchus as well but of them all it's probably the most uh, and therefore uh, partly because of the resistance and partly because of that. It's the one where there's been most work so far. And then that tends to have a, a kind of positive feedback. It's the one that more resources, more information. So those are the kind of, okay. in general terms, what the advantages. Well, what's its life cycle like? What is it? Where does it come from? And what does it do to sheep? Yeah, so it's, it's a relatively simple life cycle. As nematodes grow, and, and again, these are the round ones. Um, the adult worm lives in the... The, the stomach, essentially, the fourth stomach of the r- ruminants. It infects primarily sheep, but can effectively infect all ruminants. So it's, it's only partially host-specific in that sense. And uh, basically, its life cycle is that you've got male and female worms, which are separate sexes, that breed. Uh, the females produce eggs in very large numbers, literally thousands. Um, and these then pass out with the feces and in the feces deposited on pasture the eggs develop the infective stage l3 larval stage. so basically egg which passes out in the feces is essentially and that develops into a larvae then hatch from the egg molts twice this l3 in the feces and then they migrate out of the grass and then when they're on the grass they survive there actually it tends to be a kind of uh, and then when another sheep or other ruminant comes along and ingests grass ingests the larvae with the grass that larvae then passes up amazing well stomach again develops through a single malt to an adult worm it's funny when you said single malt i thought of like single malt scotch this would be sing, <laughs> single malt contortus yeah. instead <laughs> well, i have to remember that one uh, actually i uh, can probably use that pun on a slide some <laughs> <laughs> um, why wouldn't you um in a field of sheep i don't know if i don't know if their poops are uh you know easily i mean if they're solid or if they're like uh loose but couldn't they be treated 
in a field? I mean, either removed or treated. So maybe at that stage would be a good place to intervene. Yeah, in theory. Um, I mean, actually in horses, which have, you know, similar parasites, if you like, um, that is actually a method of control in horses. People want to control parasites, minimize drug use, which will come on to obviously. Um, one of the methods is you remove the feces before, you know, regularly enough that you don't get the infective stages developing. Um, you know, it takes up to between five days to two weeks for them to get from that egg to L3 stage. So if you re remove feces fresh every few days, you can stop a lot of pasture. If you've got one or two horses or uh, a very uh, stables in horses, or you've got the manpower and finance to do that, that's a big measure of control. But in sheep and cattle, and again, in human world, that's not really a practical. Right? So it's more a practical issue. Yeah, in theory, it would be good, but in practice, it's not really good. So once the, uh, you know, it goes back into the sheep, um, you said it goes through a single molt, but, but like, you know, let's let's go into a little more detail. It gets into the sheep, the sheep eats it, yeah. and it, like, never leaves the fore stomach. Like, what, what happens to it? How yeah. does it take hold? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's kind of biologist question. So they do stay in, in the stomach. They don't go beyond there. Uh, there are other close related species, and again, we may come on to this. Uh, parasites typically occur as mixed infection of species, and these different species live in different parts of the GI tract. Uh, but in this case, a monchus specifically lives in the stomach. And when it's there, it, it has a piercing mouth part, and it literally pierces the mucosa, causes hemorrhage, uh, and feeds on the blood. And actually, they move around a lot. Um, they basically, they're almost like grazing on the mucosal surface, um, breeding as they go. Um, and so they don't really go beyond that. Uh, the other wrinkle of the life cycle is that the L4 stage is the larval stage before the adult can decide if you want to stop its development as an L4 for a protracted period of time uh, and become quiescent of the host, the so-called inhibitor type of biota. And that allows it to survive longer and survive periods when the environmental side are not conducive to the development. So it's an evolution adaptation, which allows parasite at times and in geograms where it otherwise so how does so when does the parasite stay in the stomach versus go into the poop so the so the adult worm lives in the stomach and stays in the stomach and feeds and mates these males, males and females and then the females become full of eggs and they just lay their eggs they just pass them out and the, it's the eggs which then pass down the gastrointestinal and appear in the feces so the adults never appear in the feces. occasionally uh, if they die, they'll pass out and they tend to digest before they get there. Uh, but it's just the eggs which pass out. The adults are living in the intestine, sorry, in the stomach. Eggs pass out into the feces. So it's, the feces is really just a transmission vehicle, if you like, for the parasite. So at, at various times of the year, um, when the sheep feed, are there times when they're protected or they're not feeding and therefore there'll be no parasites taken in? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a very good point. So, so homonchus, if we stick with that for now, is, is actually, interestingly, it's a tropical part in terms of evolutionary, evolutionarily, and there's a variety of evidence. So really, the, the kind of thinking is that it evolved in um, sub-Saharan Africa, and there's a whole group of different species of the homonchus genus, which are present in that part of the world, which are not present. The homonchus contortus uh, then spread globally with the movement of livestock to Africa, and so, for a thousand years, and so... It's established now beyond the tropics. So if you go to the, the tropical regions where it's best suited, you get all year round environment, very suitable, free living development all year. Round. However, if you come to, we have big problems with it here in Western Canada, I'm sure you probably know, because very, very cold winters. Uh, and it really is not conducive to the survival of the parasite, not just its development, survival. On pasture, everything dies. So the survival of the parasite in this part of relies on those stages inside the whole surviving when there's no transit. And then when the spring and summer comes along, it takes off again. That's all the transit. So it's a very seasonal um, epidemiology transmission pattern in temperate regions, but all year in tropical regions. And actually, it's interesting in the sense that uh, this adaptation to inhibited development has allowed it to do that. If it wasn't for the inhibited development, it probably would have never got a foothold in places like West because it's those inhibited larval stages that survive inside the host during that winter period where there's, it's not conducive, free living and so uh, it's a, it's a, And actually, you see the same adaptation areas where you get severe droughts. So you get inhibition, warmer regions, but where it's very dry and not over certain times of the year and therefore not same thing happens okay. inhibits and actually the time of year it inhibits is really 
match the environment it's in. And the southern hemisphere basically inhibit at a completely different time of year than it. But it's probably sensing the host is exposed to cold yes. and then it's going quiescent for a period of months, right? Absolutely. And, and that's often it's a good point because it's often a question people ask us, how does it know what the climate's like outside? And of course it doesn't. But there are all sorts of changes in host physiology, which is seasonal reproductive. Uh, hormones and things like prolactin have been implicated. To be honest, the research is not that extensive in this area, but there's things like prolactin levels suggest, and of course, following the reproductive cycle of the host changes. Well, when the parasite is uh, active versus inactive, can you tell if you're looking at a sheep, um, you know, it's active, what, what happens to the sheep? Is it getting very sickly or is it appear to be normal? It's just, you know, pooping out the eggs or, you know, once it's quiescent is the sheep feeling better is it better off like what do you notice the difference yeah no i mean i mean in terms again in terms of homonchus specifically it's a very pathogenic uh, parasite because it's blood feeding it's actually quite a messy so you get lots of hemorrhage and it actually produces anticoagulant prevent uh, clotting to allow it to feed on blood um and so it interferes with the coagulation pathway in the whole so you get all this bleeding into the stomach uh and what I didn't mention actually is you can get worm burdens up to 20, 30,000 adult worms in a single. And there are estimates which the, the numbers escape me of the you know, number of mils of blood loss per day. Uh, but you can imagine severe hemorrhage of the stomach that causes anemia and actually can cause sudden death. And so, so if you've got a very rapid buildup of larvae on a pasture and very large numbers of worms establishing quickly, you can, the first sign you get of it sometimes is dead animal, literally dead animal. Um, it's a sudden death. Uh, more commonly though, it's kind of chronic, which builds up over the, so, so yeah, so it's, that, that's what you see. But then, you know, if you get lower burdens, um, you might not see very much other than reduction in growth rate. And it's important to remember with, with all these parasites of this type, um, you know, in terms of livestock and to some degree in human, the disease caused by them are an artifact of um, the disruption of the natural ecosystem, if you like. So if you think of, of um, ancestors of livestock or, or wild animals today, they naturally have these parasites in the gastrointestinal and they live quite happily with them 95% of the time. But what we do in livestock is um, obviously change their grazing pattern uh, in ways that allows a much bigger buildup of pasture contamination. If you get abnormally high levels of parasite burdens, which trigger this. You could argue evolutionarily these are quite healthy natural things to have in us, but it's the context of the situation can lead to these problems. Well, um, has anyone tried to, uh, like, okay, so at night, where do the sheep go? Are they like in a barn or are they just out in the fields? Where do they hang out? No, that's a, another important point, actually. Um, good questions. These are hitting really good important points. So, so the, the, yeah, so the, the, the transmission of this particular parasite is entirely uh, in a grazing situation where they're on pasture. Uh, if you put animals in a barn all year round, you don't get transmission of soil. Um, and that's because of the environment. Inside a barn with fecal contamination, it's probably the acidification of it just makes eggs not develop. So, so, so basically, you don't get transmission indoor situations. Now, in sheep, of course, the vast majority of sheep globally outdoors. But when you have them indoors, you don't get problems. With them. Well, um, is there any way to, has anyone tried to expose the sheep to, you know, I don't know, intense cold, even for let's say a half hour, you know, on, on, on a night or a couple nights in a row and see if that, uh, causes the parasites to go dormant for a little while? Yeah, I think, I think it's more complex than that. I think, I'm not sure those particular experiments are on, um, but I think, you know, I think it's more, I mean, the, what triggers um, inhibited development is very complex. It's an interplay between the exposure of the parasite before it infects the climate um, and um, the immune system of the host itself. And so the trigger to becoming inhibited is complex. Um, and so, so you would think it's unlikely that simply exposing sheep to cold for a short period of time would do it. And we kind of know that's not the case, I think, because uh, just from observational, it takes more than that to trigger it as well. And it's actually a very difficult thing to experimentally induce. One of the theories is um, the exposure of those free living stages on the pasture coal pre-programs them to be more likely to inhibit when they get inside the hole. So if you can imagine the northern hemisphere get colder, 
more and more of these things tend to inhibit. So as you go into the fall, then more of them. The problem is when you chill larvae experimentally, you can somewhat reproduce that, but it's very, um, it's not easily repeatable in a constant manner. So it's something we really don't understand as triggered. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Well, what about looking at the, um, you know, those four stomach? I don't know if you could make a port into it um, and you could sample what's going on inside of it, you know, microbiome wise and, yeah. you know, uh, metabolite wise throughout yeah. the year, you know, with and without the parasites and see like what, you know, what are they doing on there? What kind yeah. of metabolites are being produced, et cetera? Well, how does the environment change? Yeah, and, 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 and there's a little bit of that work being done, but not much of it is mainly because it's obviously quite, um, quite a major undertaking experiment. Um, I think th those experiments have really not been done too much. I mean, actually, in terms of the host parasite interface, quite a bit of interest now in organoids and having artificial mucosa and being able to do things like that in vitro, at least partial. And I think there's a bit of interest in that one because, of course, any of these experiments, when you do them, are a major undertaking. So um, a lot of the in vivo work is you have to think hard before you do it. Oh, so they're actually making organoids of uh, you know, the sheep four stomach? Yeah. yeah. Mucosa. It's, actually, cool. it's actually the abomasum, the, the fourth. Well, so rather than four stomach, it's my, my diction, you know, my pronunciation. So it's the fourth, as in the number four stomach. Oh, okay, Not sorry. The four stomach, it's fourth stomach. Um, yeah, but it's the true stomach, if you like, of the sheep. And so that that mucosa is, is something you can, to some degree, now begin to recreate in culture. And there's, I mean, it's very early days, but people are beginning to do that. That um, you know, there's a lot of potential there to look at host uh, parasite uh, in a much more manipulable manner. And, and then ultimately, in vivo experiment important. But I think in terms of getting through a number of experiments, practical way that that offers a lot of opportunities potentially. What kind of drugs have been developed, and what are they targeting? What kind of pathways? Yeah, so so I guess we should get onto the drug side because that's my work. So a lot of the background here is is I'm not a specific expert in, but yeah, the drugs uh, again, sheep are the ones for which we have most drugs, and part of that I think is because uh, they cause much more clinical disease than a big driver um, to, to, to kind of drug development of that and cattle. So so there's a number of them. The biggest one that you've probably heard of is ivermectin. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, I've heard of the drug, yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the biggest broad spectrum drug. And then there's the benzimidazole class, which is another broad spectrum drug. Uh, the benzimidazoles were the first broad spectrum drugs, which developed back in the 70s. Um, and um, the Ivermect the, was the second broad spectrum class, if you like, which is the eight. And then there's other other drugs, Flavamazole is one, and then more recently in the last five to ten years, we've got a, a few new drug classes, Monopantol is one, uh, Dequantel is another. Now, so you've got all these different drugs, and the, they all act by different mechanisms. So the benzimidazoles act by microtubule formation, and they're a bit of an outlier because most of the other drugs we use act on nervous, and particularly so ivermectin, for example, acts on a particular group and vertebrate ions, the glutamate chloride uh and then the other drugs are calling receptor channel and so so most of the drugs are, uh, are neurological in terms of the effects on the worms but the outliers the medicinal. so what happens to the parasites how do you know they're adapting and how are they adapting have you you know dissected some in various stages of exposure of the drugs and see what they do physiologically so you're talking when you say adapt you talk about resistance now specifically you or right and they become resistant you know they're again they're yeah so, so i guess both but yeah yeah, so, so, the, so the challenge of, of, of working in this area, as I said, hinted at at the beginning, is they're not very good experimental organisms. And so, so one thing is if the life cycle I've described, um, we've, or nobody's been able to recreate that in vitro. So it's not quite the same as working in back to some viruses where you can grow them in vitro and do lots of and that's it. Um, so that's a big limiting factor for experimental populations. So you, you kind of have to take experimental material from experimental infection and then harvest that and then do very specific experiments in vitro, but an adult or, or whatever. And, and they don't survive that long. So you're dealing with this somewhat artificial. So if you think of more biochemistry, physiology type experiment, some of that's certainly done, uh, but it, it is very challenging. And most of our understanding of the mechanism, genetic approach, rather than biochemical approach. And so, um, and that's come through two routes. One is 
uh, using the free living model known as Cenobitis elegans, or C. elegans, which is obviously a very famous model organism, which is the opposite end of the scale. It's ultra manipulable, uh, experimentally tractable. Uh, and then taking information from that and testing it, uh, testing the hypothesis of the parasite. Uh, and then the other thing is doing direct genome parasite. We've done some of that. And so it's, it's really taking molecular biology and genetic approaches rather than pharmacology, biochemistry, physiology. Well, what does that mean, the, uh, the genetic approach? What are you looking for? What's, what changes yeah, in the so parasite? Yeah, so, if you, take, so if, you, if you take the simplest example in terms of conception, um, I could kind of walk you through the best example we've got of, of our sure. understanding and just use that as an example. So the benzimidazole class, which was called spectrum class in the seven were developed in this, and is actually used, was, was the mainstay of control before ivermectin. And to some degree, it still is very important uh, and also extremely important right now. Uh, but that mechanism of action was worked out Actually, partly in fungi, because it's an antifungal agent, the fact that it binds axon uh, microtubule uh, and binds to beta tubule to prevent their incorporation was worked out in fungi. But it was also worked out in C. elegans shortly after by a genetic approach. And what I mean by that, with C. elegans, what you can do is free living them told. You can grow on egg. You can expose the worms to drug, literally on egg or perks in very large numbers, uh, and select the survivors at higher levels of dose, and therefore select individuals which are uh, have a genetic change which gives them and then when you establish a strain like that you can do genetic crossing and map it to identify the gene which uh, which underlies and, and because c elegans has got had for many years a fully C genome lots of genetic tools and tricks mapping down to the individual gene and mutation feasible so when that was first done uh, for the benzimidazoles Every mutant strain that was produced mapped to a single locus, or Ben Wong, which is Ben's or locus. And so it did seem overwhelmingly particular resistance, and it's a beta tubulin, and then in vitro X confirmed uh, the drug to beta tubulin. And so, but so was, that, there, was there trade offs, though? You know, in the uh, physiology of the worms, they're, they're, you know, I'm sure the gene expression changed. Yeah, and... yeah absolutely. And so, so fitness costs in these situations is a whole kind of big part of it but the thing with working with a model organism which is one of the limitations of the model organism of course when you grow worms on plates uh in an artificial lab situation they're not they're not exposed to um all the challenges if you want to put it ecologically that a, a parasite is in the wild or even that worm in the wild so just because you can throw a chemical mutagen at c elegans and find out that the gene which is the main one underlying resistance and we do that is ban one in this case. it doesn't mean to say that's what's going to happen naturally in the field because as you point out that that mutation may have major fitness now in this particular case as it turns out it doesn't so you can delete that gene and it is the worms are entirely healthy um and so and but that's on agar plates is that true in the wild and actually been a lot of subsequent which has do, been done looking at um uh, natural populations of C. elegans, and some of them are naturally resistant, and its mutations in nature also occur. Now, that's not parasite. So, so what was done then, and this is going back to the late, no, prob no, sorry, the problem, uh, by, by looking for the, the orthologous genes of homonca, uh, mutations were identical, in this case, point and codons, which were present in the population. It's possible to take um, the gene from the parasite and transform it into C. elegans, because transgenic technologies are available. And so you can rescue the mutant strain and bring it back to um, by putting in the susceptible allele from the parasite. Equally, if you put the resistant allele in the parasite, and it doesn't do that. So you've got a functional asset to show that mutations occurring in the orthologous gene of the parasite are, are functionally giving resistance. So there's a whole, you know, it's all genetic biology, fantastic at that time, which really builds up a really strong uh, evidence that this is not just C. elegans. And subsequent to that, we and, we and others have looked a lot at natural par parasite populations, homonchus and related. And over and over again, we find these particular means present. There's, there's three different, well, no, there's five different mutations we're aware of now, which are gene, natural and homonchus. And these seem to be the predominant ones. So that's the story of how going from a genetic experiment in a model organism, then testing it out in the parasite, and then going into the field in the real world, how important that mutation is. That all came together beautifully well, with that drug clock. How, how fast does the uh, 
is the new phenotype expressed? How fast is the do the mutations occur, and are they permanent? If you stop giving the drug, does the uh, worm revert back to its old ways, you know, its that's old an, expression? That's a really another great question. So, 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 so in this particular case with benzimidazole, the evidence so far is that it doesn't uh, revert back. And that's probably because mutations in this particular gene don't have much of a fitness cost. And we know that for a couple of things. There's actually recent work in C. elegans um, where mutate, and this wasn't us, this was a colleague, Eric Anders, Chicago, uh, have, have basically shown in C. elegans, if you engineer in the mutation into the C. elegans genome, and these are these codons, there's three codons, one at position 167, one at 192, if you engineer any of these mutations to the, the worm's genome, they don't appear to have any fitness costs, certainly in the lab, relative to uh, the wild type worms. And so, so that suggests there's no fitness cost. Also on the parasite, there are examples, and there's one great example from Scotland. There was a goat farm of resistance back in the 80s, and they specifically stopped using the drug uh, for 20 years, uh, but that population is still resistant. And so all this together suggests that there's no fitness, or minimal fitness cost, and thereby no reversion of the drug. However, the big caveat on that, we've got to be careful we don't extrapolate that to every drug parasite class, that situation. So I'm sure for other drug classes and other parasite species, the story might be quite different. Well, um, uh, once one of these parasites becomes resistant, though, I would think there's a trade-off, inability or something. Or, I mean, do they appear to be just as fit as before and they can feed and, you know, there's no yeah. issues. Like, you know, yeah. if you, what if you were able, what if you exposed in the dish you know, this parasite to various drugs and then deliberately infected a sheep to see what happens. Yeah. Well, as I say, in the case of benzimidazoles, it does appear from all the work that's been done so far uh, that there is minimal fitness, no discernible. And so in that particular, however, I'm sure that there is another drug, levamazole resistance, where there's a little bit of evidence that those those strains are less fit. And, and, it, and, um, and so they do get replaced back with setups. And so there's not been much work. There's a little bit of, of work on that. So I think, um, yeah, overall, but, but as I say, I think one of the big other, other questions actually kind of relates to this. why do certain parasites be quicker than others, even when they're under the same selection, which is we did a study a number of years ago in the UK looking at 100 sheep farms um, and using these next generation sequencing approaches to look for the frequency of mutation seven different species related to homonchus forms. And what you see is these mutations are very, one particular mutation is very common in homonchus, not common in Tildal Sager, which is another related parasite, uh, common in Trichostrongus vitreous, which is another one, not common in Trichostrongus cluberformis, which is another one. And these are very similar parasites. And, and these are taken out the same animals. So they're exposed to the same selection, but some of them have come down. And we don't really understand that. That could at least partially be differences in fitness in different species. It could be subtle, but but we we don't have a, a defined view on if there is a fitness or what that. Well, what, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I don't know. I, I guess you know, who am I? I'm just an outsider, but it just seems like a, a bit too narrow of a look at at what's going on with the parasite, and, and a lot of things may be missed unless uh, you know you're either coordinating with people that are looking at okay, what's happening to the animal and the parasite and expression and you know the metabolites produced etc well absolutely I mean, by yeah. just looking at genes i don't know if it'll i mean what's the goal you know how would you know okay this this new drug is working and it's going to have some uh, some ability to, to last for a while yeah well i think the, the, the question yeah i mean i think i think i mean you make a good point i mean there's lots of research that isn't done and could be done absolutely sure there's, there's quite a lot of genomic studies now increasingly comparing the you know the resistant susceptible parasites is not much in terms of metabolomics i think there's a few studies started to look at that i think the there is a challenge it's not as simple as it might seem though and i think i think um one of the one of the challenges we have with this particular group of organisms is they're hugely genetically variable so so you know there's you know, if you compare two worms, even from the same population, from the same animal, you will get a snip, for example, every 50 or 60 base pairs. And so you've got a 300 megabase genome. You're dealing with many millions of genetic differences between individual worms in the same strain, between, and if you start comparing populations. So simply comparing um, differences between um, resistant strain and susceptible 
uh, is very challenging because if, if you do expression level sample, you will find thousands. And, and presumably, although I, the point is a good one, there's probably much more that could be done with things like metabolomics and proteomics. But, but you're going to find a lot of difference in these trends, which are not related to And so it's, they are challenging areas in terms of trying to unpick just sim, from simple comparisons and throwing a, a technology at the problem. It's not quite as easy as that. In terms of your other... I think what's the other point is behind your question or point, you know, could we predict whether a drug is likely to develop resistance quickly or not? And I think um, I think the kind of things that are done on that is if if there is a, if we understand the mechanism of action of the drug um, and the target which the drug acts is an essential gene, such as mutations that target um, are going to be lethal to the organism, then one presumes that's going to be a lot less likely to get resistance quickly. And, and the benzimidazole example I gave before, one of the problems has been that that, that gene is clearly not essential uh, to the organism's viability and therefore it can tolerate. So, so with the drug discovery side and the pharmaceutical companies, they're very interested in drugs or molecules which target essential genes. On the thinking, you're going to get most likely to develop them. Of course, it can be other mechanisms, drug efflux, things like that, but at least it's a start to, to try and categorize likelihood. Um, how long do uh, sheep live? Like, how many seasons can they live with the parasite before it, you know, affects them too badly and they die? Well, well, actually, they tend to, the, the worst effect you see in younger animals are because over time, you gradually get a uh, build up. So, so you see the worst disease problems in lambs, and then you see first one, two years of adulthood, and then as they get older and older, they become more immune, just gradually. So again, it depends on the species of parasite and what. Some developing, some parasites stimulate protective income than others. So, so older animals tend to have less problems, although they're not immune depending on level. So um, do they become more tolerant to it having the parasite for multiple years? Or yeah. if you're a lamb, your mucosa is just for some reason more delicious to the, to the yeah. worms than if you're an adult? Not so much. Well, I think I think it's more to do with the immune response, right? It's acquired immunity. So, so typically, the gastrointestinal parasite um, immunity is slow to develop, but it does occur. So, so it's like any acquired immunity. You know, if you take the extreme of a, a viral infection, sometimes a single infection stimulate a robust immunity. In the case of these organisms, what tends to be acquired is continuous exposure, where you get a gradual acquiring. So, in lambs and naive or of, of relative little exposure, they'll be very susceptible. A ewe, which has been grazing for several years, has been continually exposed and so gradually has acquired a new. Um, has there been an example where the, um, the worms have passed during pregnancy to the, you know, to the fetus, to the baby? Or not, are, they not, are they not? No, not, no, not in this particular species, but there are some, some, some nematodes like that. Uh, and some pass through the milk as well. So, so, so Toxicara... Uh, is a roundworm of dogs, which is a it's a big roundworm. It's the one which the larval stage larval stages, if if they're ingested by humans, can cause some disease symptoms. So, this pet dogs get very commonly infected Toxicara, um, and actually the major source of transmission is from the mother to the pups, and so that's through uh, both placental transmission and the milk. But but the the, one, the gastrointestinal nematodes I'm talking about that's not not the so. Are there particular pathways you, that are, are targets that are being evaluated right now for new drugs? Or is it yeah. still, um, you know, not enough is known on what to do next? Yeah, no, I think, I think there's quite a bit of research going on in that area, um, both academic uh, and, and in the private sector. Of course, with the pharmaceutical companies, you never really know what they're doing. So, so, so but, but in principle, yeah, there's a, and, and then, you know, there's the arguments between empirical drug screening um, where you just screen as many compounds as possible, some kind of asset, and look for activity. And actually, to be fair, that's where most of the drug discoveries have happened um, versus targeted approach you're kind of hinting at. And so I think most of the interest is in, in iron channels because that's where the track record has been. So there are an awful lot of invertebrate specific iron channels. Some of the gene families are very large. The acetyl colon receptor family, Amonka, very big. It's about getting maybe show my ignorance here of the, the absolute number but you know 78 many of which are quite different at horse uh, and of course going back to what i said before the ideal target is an essential gene which is specific to the or, to target organism different to the host yeah there's a lot of a reasonable amount of research going on in that area of course challenging uh, an economic one in that um 
in terms of human medicine, because these organisms are mainly problems in the developing world, um, there isn't much financial incentive for drug companies to do a lot of drug discovery research. So most of the drug discovery research is actually driven by working life or, or companion just for, for the economics. It's maybe sad but true, but you can make more money from a drug of this type treating companion than you can human arm, which is the other way around to most fields. And actually the, the, the history of drug discovery in this area, the major human drugs have come out of more health research. Ivermectin is a classic example. Oh, okay. Well, very good. <clears throat> what do you think is going to be the, um, I don't know, the next steps or the things happening in the next five years? Any breakthroughs or is it slowly just kind of trudging along in terms of understanding? <laughs> You're trudging. <laughs> That's a good descriptor. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think uh, well, if you t- it depends what you're talking about in terms of, uh, uh, but if you talk about drug resistance, I think we are um, making a lot more progress than we've ever done simply because the genomic tools are getting better and better. So, so to, to, so, for example, ivermectin has been a, a thorn in, in the research side for many years because the progress in trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of ivermectin has, has been thwarted somewhat by our lack of tools. Um, but that's improving all the time because we've now got good reference genomes for the major parasites I'm talking about. And of course, the genetic, the ability to apply genomic is much more cost effective sequencing technologies are better. So the kind of genetic approaches I've talked about um, are much more likely to yield results in the next few years than they were probably over the last couple of decades, simply because it's faster. So a lot of things we've all kind of many years to do are much faster and faster. And so so, so one of our interests has been in ivermectin. So ivermectin, again, we haven't really talked about it, but the two, 2015 Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of ivermectin, and that was an animal health drug which transits to develop in the developing world. And so treatment of diseases such as lymphatic filariasis and river blindness, which are major global health problems, are absolutely not dropped from other parts. But and on the animal health, uh, it's been the mainstay of parasite control of the group of parasites we've been talking about the last two. Now on the animal health side, resistant from widespread, but we've not understood the molecular mechanism in the same way as we done benzimidazoles because what's happened on that side is um, unlike the benzimidazole story I told you where we've identified the targets the elegant they've turned out not to be parasites probably because of this cost you've talked about uh, and so run up a lot of dead ends with our med- but we started an experiment and this when you talk about trudging we started an experiment probably 12 or 13 years ago where we did some genetic crosses between uh, ivermectin resistant homonchus and susceptible and only in the last four or five years have we been able to analyze those as properly. We've now got reference sequencing technology as appropriate, where we've managed to map the major ivermectin locus to a region on chromosome five of the parasite. We're within about a hundred, several hundred genes of mapping that to the locus, but it's still not there yet. But that took 12 years to get to that point uh, with that particular set of oh, wow. experiments. Yeah. So, and, and it's simply because there was no way of doing genetic crosses, there was no reference genome, sequence technology is expensive if you go back 12 years ago. Um, but it's accelerating. It's a bit like an experiment, exponential curve now. We, you know, now we've got all the material archived, we've mapped it down to a certain region, we can reinterrogate that, and others actually, and other groups are doing similar crosses. I think the acceleration of our ability to say, this parasite is this drug, what kind of mechanism? is, you know, looking at the future is way fast, or going to be way fast, certainly the last few. So from that point of view, I think we're in a much better state. Really, I understand there is a molecular level, develop the right down what kind. Well, very good. <clears throat> the reason I said trudging is that you said there's not enough <laughs> funding there <laughs> in certain circumstances. So that would slow the progress, you know. Yeah, no, it was, it's a good point because I think people, you know, on the outside of fields think everything's done by massive breakthroughs, but in reality, things are cumulative, right? Uh, and I think one of the challenges that we have is it's a relatively small research. I mean, if you contrast it now with COVID research, for example, which overnight has become massive, the speed of progress in developing vaccines there is primarily because of the amount of dollar investment, the sheer number of people working on it. Um, this field is more a small number of, a relatively small number of labs working on a big problem. So it tends to be a little bit more trudging than massive breakthrough. Yeah. You know, instead of standing on the shoulders of giants here, you're grazing on the mucosa of giants. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. yeah. Well, very good, John. What, what's the best way to find out more 
about your work since we're out of time? How can people find you? That's a good point. Actually, we have a website, um, Lab website. Uh, if you Google my name, that will come up. Um, some of, some of it's just general lab information. Some of it's some of the tools we produce, genetics. Um, yeah, so I think that that's press starting. Okay, very good. Well, John, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No, that was good. I enjoyed it. And uh, we only touched on so many things, but it was good yeah. to chat. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.